right now you guys are not the most powerful people in society. I know this is a revelation late in the trip. Uh, but, uh, you know, right now it's, it's other people who have their hands on the controls. But um, the idea is that when you do, uh, America will be different for that because you aren't as hung up on some of this garbage as, uh, as people my age are. And uh, for full disclosure, I am 51 and was born in the year when more Americans were born than any other year in history, 1957. So, mm -hmm. uh, You're quoted saying, we're not, we're not driving you towards some conclusion about news about what to believe about the future of this country. We're trying to arm you for the work of being a good citizen. What do you think, the, what is the work of being a good citizen? Um, having life happen with you instead of to you. Um, being not always civically involved because your life is long enough that it's actually got chapters and passages and movements in it rather than just being full blast all the time. There are peaks and valleys. There are times in your life when you're going to be involved in issues in shaping the uh, discussion where you live, um, getting people to vote or persuading them of the rightness or wrongness of local decisions. And there will be some times where you're too busy getting your life in order uh, to really be involved in that every day. But you should be aware of everything that's going on around you. And uh, so instead of having your times happen to you, you should be mindful about making the times that you live in. And the news business, I'm convinced, even in my most dire, unhappy moments about the direction of my business, I remain optimistic about its power to, uh, to encourage civic engagement and um, make people shareholders in the life of wherever it is they live, their county, their state, their town, their school district. Um, and I think you can't do that without a functioning civic conversation. And the functioning civic conversation has as a precondition uh, a news business that is doing its job. I read that you got your degree in African studies and that from a young age you were, you knew you wanted to be a correspondent from Africa. And I was wondering what it was that drew you to Africa and how your experience in Africa changed you. Well, when I started college, there were three sizable civil wars in Africa and the final chapters of the Cold War were playing out there and in <coughs> Central America. Uh, Mozambique, Angola, and, and Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, uh, were in civil war. And it looked like South Africa, the regional power of, of the southern cone of Africa, wasn't too far behind. And I was just fascinated by the way the Cold War had made friends out of people who should have been enemies and enemies out of people who could have, under other circumstances, been friends. Because the struggle for equal citizenship and human rights in South Africa had been absorbed by the Cold War, our friends, America's friends in South Africa, were the leaders of the white minority regime that, were, that had secret death squads out in the country murdering their political opponents. Uh, putting people in jail uh, and having them disappear uh, after that. Uh, really bad stuff was going on, but because it had been placed into the logic of the Cold War, the white regime in Pretoria was saying, hey, look, we're capitalists. We're saving this country from being plunged into a Marxist hell. And, um, and black Africans were saying, we just want what you guys have, elections, the ability to walk on the street without fear of the secret police. Uh, we want to be free and full citizens on the streets of our own country. And the United States was overtly and covertly siding with the white minority regime. It was an amazing time in our country. And I was just 
sucked into to Africa and African history because it, it really was uh, the first big story of globalization in the modern, in the modern world. Africa was absorbed into the world economy by Europe. M America was always a cultural c colonist in Africa, never a land colonist. There was no African colony there. Uh, but Europe uh, absorbed Africa because of the world need for commodities and markets, uh, for gold and spices and manpower and places to sell excess manufacturers that were being churned out of Manchester and, uh, and Sheffield and Hamburg and Lyon. Um, Africa was, uh, in the world economy in the 19th century, what Asia is now, uh, what Central America and South America is now. So I just got, got the bug and uh, fully intended to spend a big part of my adult life in Africa. And, the reality was that uh, the American news business, even though these incredible times were unfolding in Africa, even though the final acts of the Cold War were being played out there, um, America was not interested in Africa. And even though um, Nelson Mandela was still in prison in a little island off the coast of uh, Cape Town, and Desmond Tutu occasionally had his passport seized, so he couldn't travel uh, around the country. And the government uh, was having Stephen Biko murdered and, and so on. Um, it just, Africa had a hard time piercing the uh, Europe-centered uh, vision that the uh, American news business had for the planet. Uh, think of it this way. If you looked at the organizational sheet of the three networks that existed at that time, ABC, NBC, and CBS, they had correspondents in London, Paris, Rome, Berlin, and Moscow. So in roughly 1,000 miles, five bureaus, and none on the entire African continent. A billion people in India, and no bureaus in India. Um, it was just. Incredible. If you looked at a map of the world and saw where ABC, NBC, and CBS put <coughs> correspondence, it was a, a, an illustration of their worldview, an illustration of what they thought was important in the world. And I couldn't, by myself at 22, uh, subvert that idea <laughs> about the world and how it ought to be covered. In the final analysis, I was right and they were wrong, but by the time that was apparent, I was in my 40s, and it didn't matter. Uh, but, but I was right. I was right. Africa was important, is important, and is important today. Um, but now they're closing bureaus and paying Katie Couric $15 million a year. So they're still messed up, and they aren't going to they aren't going to be there for the last call. It's, uh, the networks are very, very busy in the work of committing suicide right now. And they, uh, they, don't need, they don't need any advice from me at this point. It's, it's guns, pills, or the rope, and they're just figuring out which one they want to use. It's really unbelievable. So earlier this week, we had an interview with Ambassador Ahmed at American University. And he's considered the leading expert on Islam. And he basically gave us a college level lecture about, and we realized we didn't know nearly anything about Islam, and he knew a lot. And his main point was that our generation needs to know about Islam for the future. And my question is, what is the role of the media in understanding the complexity of this religion, and do you think it's as important that we understand Islam, as he was saying? Oh, absolutely. Look, any one out of every six human beings on the planet is a Muslim. Um, one out of every six human beings on the planet is Chinese. So would you say, well, it's not necessary for me to understand China? Of course you wouldn't. Well, it's just as necessary to understand Islam. And at this particular chapter in our shared history, it's even more important because a lot of the places that are um, home to failed states, a lot of the places where men think blowing themselves up so their family can have money 
uh, is a better shot than trying to start a store or, uh, or go get a job somewhere. Whenever you have a situation like that, you, you have to understand what's going on. Now, uh, Americans, unfortunately, since 9-11, have been given this really crazy, dysfunctional explanation of what's happening and how we got here that leaves them nowhere. It's just this bunch of scary guys who want to kill us, and we don't get it, and what's the matter with those people, which is a, it's a stupid, pointless way of, of explaining this, as if they just got up one day en masse and said, let's kill Americans. Like, there was no, no uh, proximate cause, no uh, root of the conversation. We just started there. We started with 19 guys on four planes, and that's where we started, which, of course, is ludicrous. Um, but the news business is so ill-equipped even to teach near, near history, like not of the long past, not going back to the seventh century to Muhammad being born on the Arabian Peninsula, but let's, uh, you know, let's go back to 1954 and the, um, the overthrow of an elected Iranian government where um, an elected prime minister uh, is overthrown with the help and the advice of the CIA, and they never have an election there, again, for decades. And political opposition to the authoritarian regime that's put in the place of the elected government happens where? In the mosque. It's not because Islam is in any way um, predestined to revolution. It's not because it has this fault or weakness in it that makes radicals or terrorists out of people. It's because of peculiar country by country conditions that created revolutions against <coughs> mostly European, but increasingly as Europe began to wane and America began to rise in prominence in the world, against American domination and influence. And the locus for this kind of organization became the mosque because the mosque was suppressed by authoritarian governments, uh, because uh, no normal politics could be carried on. There weren't parties. There weren't places where you could go and have open conversations about what we ought to do instead of what we're doing. So politics, in the way that we understand politics in America, was not allowed to function. Political organization got you in jail. And so, mosque became the only free space, the only social space, where some of this organizing could go on out of the direct gaze of the government. It happened in Algeria, it happened in Tunisia, it happened in Egypt, it happened in Iran. And so, you have to go back to the 50s because that's when all of these secular regimes in Islamic majority countries rose up, tried to push the mosque to the edges of society, and tried to build new societies based on a post-war, secular, socialist model of organization. Look up, when you get home, something called the Bandung Declaration, B-A-N-D-U-N-G. There, a bunch of new leaders of newly decolonized places got together and said, look, we're not with the Soviets, and we're not with the Americans, and we used to be French and British colonies, and we don't want any part of that anymore. We're this new thing, the non-aligned movement. Nehru, Indira Gandhi's father, the first prime minister of India, was one of the signatories of the Bandung Declaration. Sukarno, the first post-independence leader of Indonesia, who led, was one of the leaders of the armed revolution to resist the Dutch and then the Japanese, and now had a new country, the largest Islamic country in the world, Sukarno pff, didn't care at all for Islam. And these guys, and Ahmed Ben Bella in Algeria, 
Ben Bella couldn't even read the Quran. He was illiterate in, in Arabic. He spoke French as his dominant language, spoke and spoke in Arabic, but couldn't, if you said to him, here, <laughs> tell me what it says, he couldn't tell you. I mean, that's how removed this first generation of post-colonial leaders were from, from the traditions that had sustained these places as places for centuries until the European colonizers came. So this is, uh, I think, one thing left and right can agree on when it comes to Islam is that this is a perversion of the religion. Um, but to act like, gosh, we don't know how this all happened. How did this all happen? It's important to understand Islam. It's important to understand what it says and what it doesn't say. It's important to understand how it became the refuge of people who could not use politics. So the, again, the mosque moves in where the failures of society have created a vacuum. So Islam becomes the motive force behind social revolution. Um, it's nothing about Islam. Um, in Latin America, you had Christian spearheaded social revolutions. As discouraged as they were by the Catholic Church, uh, you had them anyway. And um, it, it never got to the point that the Islamic Revolution did, in part because they had success earlier in their life cycle. They actually succeeded in creating new social orders and new governments. And so they didn't have to start blowing everybody up and killing, doing political assassinations and, and all of that stuff. In, in Iraq, um, you've got Muslims fighting Muslims for reasons that have to do with politics and power only because confessional status and confessional association became a route to power too. Um, you know, we use Protestant and Catholic as shorthand to describe the Northern Ireland conflict. That's not quite accurate, but it's, it's decent as shorthand, I guess. Um, well, you know, they were the Sunnis and Shias of the 60s and 70s. Um, and yet nobody said, gosh, we've got to understand Protestantism to see why it is. What is it about being a Protestant that would make you shoot somebody's knees off or blow up a pub? Nobody said that, you know, gee, we ought to understand why those Catholics up there in Belfast, what is it about Catholicism that makes a man want to blow up a pub on a Saturday night? Nobody said that. Why? Because uh, we think we understand Catholicism, so it doesn't seem mysterious to us. And we, doesn't, we, we wouldn't have thought that it's because of the reverence for the Virgin Mary or the belief that uh, the host becomes the, the true body and blood of Christ, you wouldn't think that that would make you blow up a, um, a pub. Well, neither is anything in the Quran um, making you more inclined to blow up a bus in Tel Aviv. This is because politics is not an avenue for social change in all of these countries, and certainly the Palestinians uh, don't feel that merely petitioning as the Constitution says, petitioning for redress of grievances will make the Israelis leave the West Bank. Gosh, boy, I am going to write them a letter to the editor that will make their head spin. You know, it's, it's so a revolution becomes tinged with the mosque because it's very difficult to do any social action that's effective in these countries without ending up in jail and mysteriously dying while in captivity. Thank you. A significant part of your job is to uh, sift complex issues and present them in a way that's more understandable to the public. And uh, I'm wondering how you go about that task. Um, with any story, you've got to find um, the narrative thread that will make people interested in it as a story. Even if they feel like they don't have any particular connection to the issue itself, there's something about the story that if you tell it well, People who are interested in the news, widely defined, will be interested in this story. Somebody who's not interested in the news at all, who's allergic to the news, is not, no matter what I do, no matter how clever or creative I am, they're not going to be into it. And that's that. So rather than trying to catch the most uncatchable, what you do is you try to catch the gettable. 
<coughs> the people who you say, well, if I do my job well, I can make them sit and watch 15 minutes on Burma. Um, so part of it is, is finding a way to tell the story that, that pulls people in and keeps them engaged. Sometimes, but not always, there's uh, an ancillary uh, benefit, which is there's part of this that affects them. So that when they sit down, they say, well, what does this have to do with me? Again, something you can do sometimes, but not always. It's nice when you can do it, but it can't be a necessary precondition because, again, uh, the news hour would only be a half an hour long if we had to take every story and say, and here's what this has to do with you. We do our work with the assumption that you're interested enough in the world to, to hang in there with us and find what's interesting to you and what's necessary to you. Um, so I want to find what's interesting in part, in part out of selfish reasons, because I want to be interested too. And I'm the first audience for any story I do. Uh, but also I do it uh, very much keeping in mind the needs and desires and interests of the audience at large, the several million people who are watching every night across the week. Um, it means being a quick study. It means um, being aware of what's happening, not just on one, but on 15 different stories so that you don't have to go to school on it on the particular day when it finally lands in your lap. Uh, if I had to uh, explain the, the war supplemental sort of just based on today, I'd be in rough shape because there's just no way that I could understand all the ins and outs of it by 5 o'clock today. So this is something that I've been following along with uh, the price of oil, along with the waning days of the Bush administration, along with China and the uh, earthquake recovery, along with Myanmar and uh, the UN's efforts to, uh, to force aid into the country. I interviewed the Secretary General of the United Nations on Friday, so I did prep for that. But then I interviewed the American Chargé d'Affaires in, uh, in Rangoon yesterday, and the prep that I did Friday for interviewing Pangi Moon, you know, I didn't forget it. I didn't dump files. I didn't erase my hard drive, you know, and it's still there along with the several other stories that I'm tracking at any given time. So one of the ways you sound so smart on the news hour is by um, not trying to know everything you need to know in one day. It's part of the job to constantly be prepping for stories that you have a reasonable expectation will land in your lap, if not tomorrow, then Friday, or next Monday, or the Wednesday after that. Um, Mr. Suarez, you had said earlier that we're becoming a little less Eurocentric and um, gaining a little more interest in stories uh, in Africa and other countries. Do you think there are any stories right now that deserve to be covered that aren't being covered? Yeah, I mean, I can only talk for another half an hour, so uh, I can't tell you all of them. But uh, yeah, you know, look at, well, look at uh, $4 gas. We had all those bureaus in Europe. It wasn't Europe that was creating $4 gas. It was all the places in the world we weren't covering very heavily. Um, to understand $4 gas, you have to understand Hugo Chavez and uh, Latin America has been appallingly badly covered by the American news business for decades. Um, you have to understand the politics of countries where oil has been a kind of systemic poison. Uh, the, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen has pointed out for a long time that uh, if you look at the most oil rich places in the world, uh, the maybe two dozen or so countries with all of the world's oil, almost none of them are functioning democracies. Now, a few of them are, but for the most part, not. Well, why is it? What is it about having all that oil that actually makes it hard to be a democracy? 
and it turns out there's just too much damn money to be made, which fosters corruption, which fosters forces inside the government uh, t taking over um, in un undemocratic ways the, um, the mining and distribution of oil and the capture and, um, and sequestering of the wealth. If you're the strongest guy in the government, you're going to have the strongest say over what happens to all the oil. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we haven't covered the, developed world, the developing world very well at all. So we don't, know, don't understand what globalization means to them. We know what it means to us. And I, don't, I think on a lot of days, Americans, rank and file Americans, aren't particularly happy with what globalization has meant to us. But they have a very hard time imagining what it means to, to people who are at the other end of the rope in this global tug of war and how it's changed their lives. We do a really bad job of explaining the economy of the world in a way that has Americans understanding how the way they spend their money affects decisions that are being made in all kinds of other places. Uh, to use a tiny example, during the uh, 1980s, when diamonds began to be even more, diamonds have always been expensive, but they really started to take off as a commodity in price in the 1980s. And suddenly, a fashion developed not just for great big rocks, but for things like watch faces and necklaces and bracelets with diamond chips. And I'm sure you've all seen pieces of jewelry that have diamond chips in them. Well, so now in the jewelry stores of North America and Western Europe, you went into stores and there was all this stuff with diamond chips. Nobody said, gosh, where are all those diamond chips from? How come my parents in the 40s and 50s didn't have diamond chips on their jewelry? Surely there must have been diamond chips then, right? Well, what happened was that diamonds became so expensive as a commodity substance that the flakes that came off a diamond that you were polishing for gem quality began to be conserved too because people said, hey, you know, now that they're $1,000 a carat, how can we just throw away these flakes? Hold on to them. So you polished the gemstone. You had all this detritus left over. But in Antwerp and Tel Aviv and Midtown Manhattan, the three big centers of the world diamond trade, diamond polishers said, oh, you know, we don't want to spend time polishing the flakes that we're, we're just interested in polishing the gemstones. OK. So you have to go someplace where what is cheaper? Labor. So now there are children in India, um, some of them locked into the factories where they work, some of them chained to the floor of the factories where they work, sitting, and they've got little fingers so they can work with chip diamonds, and sitting with ancient equipment that hasn't been used anywhere in the West to polish diamonds for decades. Polishing diamond chips, which are then recaptured by De Beers and the World Diamond Cartel and distributed as a secondary product. So you go into a store, and if you're fortunate, you might get something bought for you someday with diamond chips in it. And you, that connects you, connects you with an iron cable to the life of some kid in India. But you don't know that. It's just diamond chips. And believe me, the clerk at the counter isn't going to pull out the tray and say, oh, take a look at these lovely pieces. They're done by near slave labor in India. Uh, I thought you'd like to know that. Um, you know, there is no connection with your individual consumer choice and the consequences of individual consumer choice. The fact that we want to, and during the last two years, I believe, 
we as a country spent more than we made. Mm -hmm. A shocking, incredible thing for a country as rich as this one to save so little that we actually spent more money than the country made in national income. Well, where did the excess come from? Does anybody talk to you about that? Well, now we're starting to reckon with it. But in the recent years, as year after year after year, we've saved almost nothing as a people, uh, that money has come from overseas inward capital flows. And what's an overseas inward capital flow except for money that is not being used there in the country where it is domiciled as capital and instead is being sent to Americans um, to buy things made in other countries with? Well, if you are a, a Chinese worker who would like to make more money, this is of incredible consequence to you. And if you're a Chinese leader who has to make a choice between continuing to invest the national wealth in creating more export capacity or allowing national wealth to stay in the country so that a consumer society can develop there, you have a decision to make too. But in the peculiar case of China, since nobody elected you, they can't get mad at you and kick you out of office if you've decided, you know what, Chinese worker, I'm going to keep you poor a little longer just so I can lend more money to those ridiculous Americans who will then buy more stuff from us. You know, it's, we never get down to the level of analysis where you think, oh, well, yes, it does make a difference if I do this instead of that. It does make a difference. And your life is connected with the lives of people that you'll never meet, you'll never see. All of you fellas in the room, uh, unless I miss my guess, when you get back to your hotel tonight and you take off your nice cotton or cotton blend shirt, there's a tag in the neck that says it was made somewhere else. Now, 20 years ago, that shirt would have been made in the United States. Now it's made in Honduras or Malaysia, or Mauritius, or Bangladesh, anywhere but here. Well, your shirt and your purchase of that shirt, or the purchase of that shirt on your behalf, had a tremendous impact on the person who made that shirt. Uh, and we are very much connected with the lives of people everywhere, and we just don't talk about it very much. We make it like that's their problem, and I don't have any, I don't have, you know, I didn't make them chain some kid to the floor. I just wanted a bracelet with diamonds in it. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. If you wouldn't buy it, they wouldn't do it. If they charged you more and paid the kids more, well, kids wouldn't do the work. Adults would do the work because it would actually be work that was thought to be desirable and they wouldn't give it to kids. Kids only do the most undesirable jobs in every society. Kids aren't assembling high-value items and getting paid a good wage for it. Kids are doing the worst work in the world. So if you priced the work differently, the bracelet or the watch would be priced differently, and an adult would be doing it, and an adult has a choice. Do I want to sit with goggles on all day and polish diamond chips, or don't I? There at least is some agency in that. You can decide that you're going to do that or not. You can decide to move to the city and leave the farm or not. There's a lot of choice that you have as an adult, even though your choices are prescribed in a lot of these countries because life is so hard, you have more choice than a child does. And so, you know, the, the news business in the United States wants to keep people happily consuming. We are much more interested as a business in your life as a consumer than in your life as a citizen. And that's a real structural problem in the business. Why is that? Because we have a profit-driven, ratings-driven, circulation-driven model that's run on advertising. If we had a different model, we might have a different focus. But because it's an advertising and ratings-driven business, we want to keep you checking for stuff and buying stuff and buying our product, too. It's just the way it is. It's not, you know, I'm not 
saying that we now have to tear everything up and start from scratch and get a different model for our business. But we should be eyes open about the fact that when we have this model for a national information system that runs on circulation and ratings and profit and page views and page impressions and all the new metrics that they're using for web advertising, that advertising, which after all is the business of getting you to buy stuff, is going to be very much a feature of what we do. I have a question. So you said we, we buy or we borrow money from China or wherever and to buy products from there. How, and this, is, this seems to me like just a slippery slope, an endless spiral of just um, degra de degradation of, of our society. How do we stop that? It's hard now. It would have been easier 20 years ago. But the Pied Pipers of globalization made it all sound like this was a no-cost proposition. That, hey, we can just buy from everywhere and sell to everywhere, and God, it's going to be great. And ask, if you ask the people of Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Illinois, who no longer make steel and no longer make cars and no longer make you know, people in Philadelphia who no longer make radios, um, they, they probably might, would have a slightly different take on the whole matter. Um, the logic of that kind of model of globalization, the way it was sold to us was that we'd still do the good stuff, the stuff that has high profit, pays good wages, and gradually all the crummy stuff would go off shore. But now even the good stuff is gone. So Rochester, uh, home to Kodak, is suffering. Kodak, Bosch and Lam, uh, Xerox. Rochester was a, a tremendous concentration of engineers and designers and high-tech workers dying, dying. Um, even the good stuff is going along with the stuff that people found mind-numbing and too low paid and all that. And you know, even the, those jobs. I'll bet there's a lot of towns in North and South Carolina that wouldn't mind having the rug mill back or wouldn't mind having the towel factory back. Um, the logic of it, where does it end? I guess it ends with no one really making anything here anymore. Uh, and I say that not as somebody who's an economic nationalist, but as someone who's never been able to get a really good answer from people who make economic policy in the United States where it does all end. Uh, once I was having lunch with the Secretary of the Treasury, and um, I said to him, look, uh, if you live in central Ohio, shouldn't you be predisposed to buy a Honda? Because Hondas are made in Marysville. The transmission is made in Marysville. The sheet metal is, uh, is stamped in East Chicago, Indiana. And actually, you have some interest in a Honda that you don't have in a, in a car that's a Volkswagen. And he said, that would be ridiculous if you did that. If you started out with the predisposition to buy a Honda and you bought one for any other reason than it was the cheapest, best car, then you would be acting in a ridiculous way. And I thought to myself, wow. The Secretary of the Treasury of the United States actually doesn't think there's any percentage in Ohioans buying cars made in Ohio. Where are we at? If that's the case, where are we at? And uh, that was a very, very sobering lunch to have with a guy, one of whose jobs is to keep the American economy afloat, uh, and have him say, yeah, well, you'd be stupid if you, you know, if a Honda was uh, your first choice because it was made in Marysville. Amazing. Um, and the, the, the clothing business among all businesses is really among the worst because the <laughs> margins are tiny. And because the margins are tiny, the pressure is on to milk those margins to the degree possible. 
So you're pushing workers to do more in less time for less wages than really seems possible. So you have the labor contractors bidding to worldwide retailers and manufacturers, no, we can bring in, we can bring in that item for $10 per hundred pieces. I know your latest bid is $10.50. We'll do it for $10. And somebody else will say, no, we'll do it for $9. And that's done on the backs of the most powerless, least well-paid people on Earth. And it's just the most easily to hand example. Those sorts of relationships now exist in all kinds of things. Uh, everything on this table used to be made in the United States and is now made somewhere else. Glassware in Romania, Slovakia, and Poland. Uh, silverware is all made in Taiwan and, and uh, eastern China. Uh, and on and on and on. So just one easy example of your connection to what's going on in the rest of the world and why it matters. I mean, look at our presidential campaign where those three candidates have gone through parts of the country where there's no jobs making anything anymore and tried to get them to vote for them and not discourage them at the same time. Well, Mitt Romney went to Michigan and said that he can get back auto manufacturing jobs in Michigan. I, I nearly drove off the road when I heard him say that. Um, and I was driving in a car that was, uh, that was made in Japan. Uh, I, it was, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen unless Michiganders want to make $7.25 an hour to make cars, which I'm assuming they don't. But perhaps if it's the only game in town, I don't know. But workers who bring to the table what a Michigander who used to make cars does, a high school diploma, and the willingness to work on the line all day, American manufacturers don't want to pay $20 an hour for that. They say, look, I can get a high school diplomate who's willing to work on the line all day in Hermosillo, Mexico. The secret of globalization. Here's the secret of globalization. I was sitting with the chairman of Volkswagen. Now, this is a diversified, worldwide company with production and distribution and a customer base all over the world. And I said to him, Mr. Hahn, once a Volkswagen Beetle comes off the line in Hermosillo with the same number of manufacturing defects per 100 cars as you accomplish in Wolfsburg, which is their main manufacturing center in Germany. I said, once the Mexican worker reaches that level of quality, how long will it be till he gets paid what a German worker gets paid? And he says, oh, my dear boy, never, never. I said, never? He says, no, of course not, never, it will never happen. That's the secret of globalization. We used to be told that it was because they were lower skilled. We used to be told that it was because they were um, not able to build a world standard product that workers in the developing world got paid less. Now they just get paid less because they have a Mexican passport in their pocket instead of a German one. That's what it comes down to. That's the logic of globalization right there. So that Mexican worker, he can work well, he can work smart, he can suggest to his foreman a way that they can move a car down the line 30 seconds faster or uh, put on that trunk lid in a way that uh, yields fewer defects once the, the thing is inspected for fit and finish at the end of the process, and he'll never make what a German worker makes. Period. So, I know I've cheered you up this morning. <laughs> um, but what, what you should take away from all of this is that the world is complicated and bewildering, but also exciting and, uh, and needs, bears watching, bears the kind of watching that you'll have to do as adults and hopefully the news business will allow you to do. I got to go to work now, uh, but it was uh, good seeing you. Thank Take care. You.